Hello uh, and welcome everyone tuning in live today and of course those now listening on demand. Thank you all for joining us for a hugely exciting exclusive conversation that we have in store for you today and a conversation that I've been really looking forward to actually for some time now. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Owen. I head up our energy transition team at Reuters Events and I'll be your chair throughout today. Um, today we'll be exploring how we can power a low carbon future across both energy and industrial sectors. We'll look at how technology and digital transformations um, are affecting this uh, transition and we'll zero in on how software can enable and speed the transition further. Um, to share their expert opinions and insights, I have the pleasure now of introducing Linda Ray, General Manager for Power Generation and Oil and Gas at GE Digital. Hi Owen, nice to be here. Likewise, it's good to have you with us, Linda. And Colin Paris, Senior Vice President, uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at GE Digital. Thank you, Colin. Hi Owen, pleasure to be here. Likewise, thanks for, for, both, for both joining. Um, let's jump straight into it. Um, there's a huge amount that we could cover today. Um, so perhaps Linda, we'll, we'll come to you first. And, and really, first and foremost, I'm keen to understand if you're seeing a change in how heavy industry views digital transformations in light of this wider energy transition that, that we're going through. Yeah, most, most definitely. I think, first of all, we've seen a shift towards more focus around digital transformation just as part of COVID, as more workers are working remotely and, and industries have to sort out how to deal with those challenges and the great resignation and the changes going on with their workforce. But then the energy transition just exacerbates some of those challenges, particularly when it comes to industries' commitments to reducing their own carbon footprint to being compliant with government standards and to contributing to their own, um, to their own ESG models and, and commitments there. So I think both of, both of those factors are contributing to a variety of industries recognizing that they need to employ digital as part of the solution to bringing their own emissions down and to their own role that they play in the global energy transition. Yeah. Can, I, can I elaborate a little bit on that? Because I think Linda said yeah. it perfectly there, but I, I also think the, and what Linda laid out is that there's a lot of dynamics happening right now, right? If you've seen, um, she mentioned some of them, there is the climate change, the energy dynamics. So customers wanting things, there's the dynamics of the environment with COVID, the workforce is changing at this point in time and there's the dynamics of what the government wants. And all this has to happen in light of a stable install base we've had for decades. And then add to that, we have to perform, which is deliver electricity, you know, in a stable, affordable manner and transform. So the complexity there is, you know, it's overwhelming. And so as Linda talked about, digital is going to be needed to actually be able to solve all of these dynamics while you're trying to perform and transform at the same time. Mm, no, absolutely. And you know, we talk about this idea of the, the dual challenge quite a lot, but I think actually it's, it's much more broad than those two things. Is that there's a huge complexity there. Um, another thing that we hear a lot about, you mentioned kind of, uh, kind of post-COP26 landscape, um, is that need for urgency and that need for scale. So perhaps, Colin, we'll come, come back to you again on this one. How do we increase the speed of the transition going forward and how do we deliver scale that's now so clearly needed? Yeah, um, I think there's two things when you talk about speed and scale, right? One, in, in one aspect of it is that we do need to do ch climate change fairly fast given what we're seeing in terms of these weather events. In fact, even right now, the weather events happening in part of the US and parts of the world. So these weather events are increasing. And I mean, just last, in 2020, I think it was $95 billion worth of damage being done by them. So the speed and scale is right there. Scalar weather events is worldwide, the speed is happening. The other speed and scale is that people are actually getting all of these electric vehicles there. They're trying to do the right things on a consumer perspective. And so when you think about that, um, part of that leads naturally to digital, the sense of I have to collect all this information about the state of the asset we have or the network, right? At a large scale, and I've got to quickly decide how do I understand what's the state of the network, state of the gas turbine, you know, how do I then 
predict what it needs to be and then optimize to get it there and do the controls to get it there. So this speed and scale aspect actually is core to everything we do, not just in responding to the environment, but also, you know, even in longer time frames, trying to figure out what will be and what we have to do and responding to those as well. Yeah, if I could jump in there, one of the things that we found that we think really has to accelerate here based on the, the demands that Colin just talked about is the need to go from thinking about this transition at a site level or a plant level to thinking about it at an enterprise level. I think that's one going to be one of the keys to the speed and scale that the world needs is for organizations to think more, more broadly and think at a higher level about their digital transformation. There's a there's a temptation to plug in a lot of point solutions at a site level or a plant level or an ind or an individual facility level. And it, it might get you a little bit of short-term gain, but it's really that enterprise level transformation that's going to have the biggest scale and the biggest impact that we need. And the other, the other aspect to that is just thinking about the, the scalability from a change perspective. When you change at the enterprise level, it brings with it an entire set of challenges around change management that are also really important to get in front of if we're going to see the, the kind of speed that we need to see. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you kind of mentioned that uh, around the transformation and some of the more specifics, I definitely wanna to come to those, but you were also talking about um, I guess kind of the, the broad scope of this and how this is very much um, kind of a, uh, an international global phenomenon, phenomenon that, we're, that we're going through at the moment. So I'm interested to know how, on the one hand, it, it's similar globally, but also how does the landscape vary globally and in different regions that, that you guys are operating in? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump into that first, but I know Colin will have something to, to add to there as well. I mean, certainly there are variations from region to region around the world, starting with where each region is today, both from a supply and demand perspective, and what kind of fuel sources different regions are heavily reliant on today. We know there are major parts of the world that are still very reliant on fossil fuels, including coal. And it's going to take time for those parts of the world to move off of coal and move toward renewable sources. We also know that the growth in demand varies in different parts of the world. There's gonna be significant growth in demand in the Asia regions over the course of the next 20, 30 years. And that growth in demand coupled with the changes in fuel supply are really those challenges. And those are gonna vary from region to region. The, the more developed parts of the world Europe, for example, is a little bit further along in deploying renewable resources, and maybe we'll see a little bit less growth in demand, so they're maybe in a stronger situation overall. But then you get to some of the more developing parts of the world, Africa and Latin America, significant growth in demand, and really an opportunity to think a little bit more forward-looking with regard to the types of fuel sources they're going to be reliant on. Yeah, I'd love to build on that there because I think Linda hit it perfectly well. So you have these categories right around the world, right? So you have these centralized grid capabilities with these fossil fuel based sources. You know, an example, developed countries, as Linda mentioned, Algeria is a great one like that. Then you have these centralized grids, but with renewable sources like Denmark. Then you have these distributed grids that have distributed sources like California, New York. Every one of them is different. And more than that, they have a different trajectory. Because again, the consumers in that area, the regulatory capabilities, the markets that could be built, are all very different. How do you adapt to all of them? And all of them have different weather conditions. All of them have different conditions by which people are adding new demands or you know, adding new capabilities like you know, ele um, electric vehicles. So the only way you do that is with something that can be adaptable, it's intelligent enough to see what's happening, adapts to it fast enough and optimizes, which is where we get back to this discussion about software and then using that software to help your current workflow, you know, who needs to change with that culture as well. So there's a lot of pieces here that the digital element seems to be a core, you know, piece of the solution going fast. Mm, absolutely, no, um, 
it's been a really nice uh, way to kind of, I think, set the scene for those those listening. But let's let's dig into, I guess, that that digital element and that technology um, element now. Um, Colin, perhaps you can talk to us about the importance of technology to the transition more broadly, and then you know how GE is really kind of assessing this moving forward. Yeah, well, well, um, there are two elements of G here. One is there's physical things we've got to do, right? So um, in, in many cases, we're experimenting with new fuels like hydrogen. We are actually doing carbon capture so that you can capture carbon from the fossil fuel pieces you have. There's small modular nuclear reactors. There's hardware elements of the grid. But all of these things, Linda talked about the fact that this is a system. It's not one component. It has to work together in a way that we could give you stability, right? Because it's got to be on all the time. It's got to be affordable. It's got to be secure and it's got to be efficient, right? And so how do you do all of those pieces? This is where the power of the software and the analytics and the workflows come on top of these things to give us the ability. And you're trying to do two, a couple of things. You're trying to plan way in advance. You're trying to get early warnings on things. You're trying to predict what will happen so you can have the right sort of things in place and you're trying to optimize you know, in a constantly moving dynamic environment. So this is the power of that digital software and these pieces tied tie together, right? Um, Linda, your, your, your insights here? Yeah, no, I think that what was, what was going through my head, Colin, was it is the ultimate multivariable equation. And the okay. equation is getting more complicated because you're adding new fuel sources and you're changing demand patterns. And the, the demand is influenced also by the need to move towards electrification of some of those uh, um, worse emitters, right? So as we move cars from being gas run to electric, that changes the demand pattern, but then the fuel sources that you need to generate that electricity for that emission-free car can also generate emissions. So you've got a very complicated problem to solve. And it really does need the types of artificial intelligence and machine learning and digital twin technologies that digital brings to the table. Otherwise, you're never really going to get to the perfect level of optimization. And so those digital tools are what allows our customers to think through all of these variables and at various times, based on weather, based on demand patterns, based on the health of their assets, based on other factors that they need to take into account to optimize their output, to maximize their revenue, to minimize the impact on their assets themselves, and to reduce their costs. So it really is a, an opportunity that only digital tools can really solve. Yeah, let, let me play off of that here, because I love what Linda said, because, you know, we tried to solve this before. And the way we solved this before is that we overbuilt everything. Can I not build capabilities two or three X what I need? And this way you cover any dynamics. But here's the problem right now to overbuild, especially with renewable resources, right, which is the, the, the clean energy resources, you need two or three renewable plants, whether it be solar or wind, versus one combined cycle plant that's doing gas, mm -hmm. right? And right now, when you try to do that, people are reluctant to say, I'd like to have more high level transmission wires going on. I'd like to have more pipes being dug up to add things to the capability. So you're in a situation, and then who's gonna pay the cost for that to have all the success capacity? So you're right now at a point where, and given the speed, you have to, to do things using the digital tools or else you, you're not going to be in a situation where you can deal with the speed and scale we're dealing with. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think you both kind of pick out the, um, the real kind of huge complexity when it comes to this technology and this, and this digital space. But of course, to, to try and simplify that down and ask you a more direct question around it, often when I speak to, to folks on these topics, they sit within two camps. You know, you have people who are saying on the one side, um, that we don't have the technologies that we need. We need R&D fast. If we're going to get to these 2050 targets or whatever the target may be, we need more technology. We need more R&D. On the other side, we have folks saying we don't have the time for more R&D. We have to work with what we've got and then we have to roll that out here. So I guess the question is, when we look at this complex landscape and this complex equation that, that you were talking to, Linda, um, do we have the technologies that we need available today to, to drive this transition forward or do we need further innovation? 
Yeah, well, I think the, the obvious answer there is all of the above, right? So we do have some some very compelling technologies today. I mean, I just talking within our portfolio, we've got technologies that help monitor and, and predict asset health and help reduce operating and maintenance costs so that that expense can be repurposed into R&D. We have good tools today that help optimize the operation of turbines of nuclear facilities that will help reduce emissions, improve energy efficiency. We've got good tools in, in our digital twins that help our customers predict when issues might be arising and then analyze and get to the root cause of what those issues are quickly. And then of course, on the hardware side, we are starting to see some interesting traction around carbon capture technologies, direct air capture technologies, running gas turbines on hydrogen mixes and ultimately on pure hydrogen, and then different technologies around how to produce that hydrogen in the, the lowest emissions impact way. So all of that is in play and all of that also has opportunity to be further refined and further utilized. Another thing that we use within GE is the, the concept of lean. So as we want to put more investment into the innovative technologies that we need for the future and to help drive energy transition, we utilize lean tools to reduce waste in other parts of our businesses so that we have that capability to repurpose, we call it dynamic resource allocation. We can dynamically allocate resources in different ways to maximize the investments we can make. So, um, but yeah, plenty of technology already there to be used mm -hmm. and that under prototypes and under exploration, and of course, a lot more work to do. Yeah, I'll add to that a bit here. I think Linda's very right. I mean, we the reality is we have to deal with it now, right? Storms are here now, weather patterns are here now, carbon is here now. So we can't wait for it to be invented. So we have technology now. In the future, yeah, we'll need more, right? So there's a class of things that um, we can use more of. And, you know, there's a whole set of carbon capture systems because the reality is for the large steel and cement and fertilizer plants, you're not going to suddenly use renewables for those. So you've got to use cleaner fuels. You've got to do those type of things, carbon capture, carbon storage. You also need to optimize the grid. It's 35% utilized. Could we give it high utilization with less carbon? Definitely. In the future, yes. I mean, clearly, for instance, forecasting tools. Can I you do better forecasting on the demand with all these electric vehicles and these solar panels? What's the demand that I need? Because some days the sun won't shine. So it depends on the weather. Some days the wind won't blow. So can I do better forecasting? Can I do better distributed systems management? The difference now on the grid is that we still have generation on one side, which is the large combined cycle plants, the large nuclear facilities, the large wind turbines. Now we have the generation on the distribution side. People are pulling up with the EVs. People are willing to sell back that. People have batteries in their homes. They can sell back that energy. So now you have distributions on both sides. So what are the tools that allow you to manage both of these markets? And then finally, the market tools. How do I actually you know, create a market methodology whereas I can incense someone to sell me back electricity in certain days or to use less on certain days? So there are new innovations, but we have to start now and we do have some interesting things that are being used right now in Linda's portfolio. Yeah, just adding on that to that market comment, in addition to the electricity market, which has all of the dynamics that Colin just talked about, there's the carbon market, right? There's a whole new market being created with carbon mm -hmm. credits, uh, carbon tax credits. So one of the ways that a lot of companies are projecting to get to their net carbon neutral targets by 2050 is utilization of carbon credits. Uh, that's what that's where the word net comes into play, right? And um, and so that's an entirely new market where there's monitoring to be done, there's predicting to be done, there's training to be done, there's monetization of those carbon credits. That's an additional area where we believe there's plenty of opportunity for digital tools to play a role. Mm. Mm. Absolutely, and uh, I'm keen actually to come back, I guess, then to um, that kind of R and D space and. And the innovation space in just a moment. But before we move on, um, when we boil this kind of boil this all down, then and we look at the role of the digital transformation as it pertains to the energy transition, um, if you had to kind of 
condense that and say, you know, why, why is digital so important for decarbonisation? Is it, is it just an efficiency play? Is it also around that monitoring and, and the things that you were just starting to touch on there, Linda? But um, perhaps, Colin, we'll come to you first. Why is digital so important for, for decarbonisation? Well, well uh, I think we go back to that whole notion of, you know, there are so many dynamics. Linda described how many things change. Mm -hmm. And you're constrained. You've bought assets. You, you have billion, trillions of assets in the ground. You can't change them. It's not like I need to get the latest version of the cell phone and so I buy something new in two years. The life of these assets you know, are 30 to 50 years easily. So now if you look at this, you say to yourself, all right, so what do I need to do? I need to understand the state of my assets, right? So either I understand how much energy I can generate and how much energy that's demanded. And that's, again, digital tools to visualize that, just to collect sense information at any given point in time. Digital tools to project it. Okay, so I know what it is now. Can I project what it might be in the next year or two? Or next four or five years, I know to build out. So digital is helping you just understand your current situation and future situation. Then digital actually helps you with control. Now, how do I actually run my networks and deliver the energy that's generated and the energy that's taken in? Can I have a command center that tells me, okay, here's what's happening right now. Do I have software to control it? And do I have software to give me predictions five minutes ahead, a day ahead, a week ahead of things I need to do? And then finally, there's optimization, right? So optimization says, okay, so how do I take all of these carbon credits and how do I take everything I have and optimize for that question people want? I want my energy cheap. I want it stable, never goes down. I want it reliable and resilient. So when there's storms, it comes back up quickly and I want it clean. So you have to go from the visualization and the understanding all the way to the prediction, the management, and then finally the optimization or digital capabilities. That's where digital starts with you all based on data you gather or you have to get from someone else. Right, yeah, and that, that's where it goes back to, it's really a, an orchestration problem, right? As Colin mentioned, we've got lots of fossil fuel generation sites today that aren't gonna be turned off tomorrow. First of all, we know that even with the projected growth of renewables, we can't produce enough renewable energy predictably, reliably to meet the growth in demand. So we're always going to be dealing with multiple fuel sources, at least for the next 30 years or so. And that requires then orchestration. It it's going to create, it's going to increasingly become complex with regard to when am I providing energy through renewable sources versus when am I relying on older fossil fuel sources? And that orchestration is really a, a task that is not something a human's going to be able to do in real time. It's going to re, it's going to need the kind of digital capabilities that we talked about. And then when you add in the complexity that there are renewable sources within the grid itself, distributed renewable sources, that adds to that orchestration problem. So I, I think there's really no possible way that we get through the energy transition that we've all committed to without digital tools. It's intricate to the success of that transition. And that's, that's helpful and, and really helps to kind of crystallize, I guess, that, that importance. Um, I said a moment ago that I was yeah, keen to come back to the R&D space, so um, perhaps we'll come to, to you first. Um, what mechanisms can we use to further drop R&D then if we are in agreement that we do still, you know, whilst we do have brilliant tools here, we do still need to continue to, to develop and, and, and innovate. Well, I think, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, no, 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 go ahead, Linda, I'll, I'll follow up. <laughs> I, I think it, it starts with some of the things we just talked about. It starts with utilizing the digital tools that are available today to drive cost out of those parts of the organization where costs can be reduced, O&M costs, for example, operating and maintenance costs, um, mm -hmm. outage costs, by stretching outages out because you have better information and, and better insight into the health of your assets. Those are ways where you can take cost out and redeploy those investments into R&D. Lean tools are another way of taking waste out of your organizational structure, your processes, 
and then redeploying those assets into R&D. And then I, I think there are real, there are important consortiums that are being formed. I mean, this is a global problem. We're not gonna solve this with every company working on their own thing in isolation. There are a number of different examples, one of which we just announced where we're partnering with a number of different organizations as part of some work tied to COP27. But these consortiums are, are one way to increase the scale and the impact of the R&D work that is in front of us. Sorry, Colin, go ahead. No, 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 I, I think you beautifully said it. I mean, I, I, I think Linda, I mean, there are two things, right? There's a capacity for R&D, and then there's the actual innovation, new innovation techniques you use in R&D. That's the things we're looking at. I think Linda talked about the capacity, right? Two aspects of it, one is lean. You're right, but lean does two things. Lean not only you know, allows you to take out waste, so you have extra dollars, it frees up top talent, right? Because you now, you know, a lot of people who were working on these things we didn't need to work on get freed up, which is what's gonna be needed. Great minds and brilliant ideas who can experiment quickly to get this done. So that's the capacity for the R&D itself. Then the R&D, new ways of R&D, I mean, Linda talked about a few. One is this notion of how do we actually team so there are research centers, there's government funding that's coming in right now that's tied, you know, not only in various countries like in the US, but the US is also doing things with Europe, they're doing things with Israel, you know, to try to pull these things together. But we're doing it with customers too, because this has got to be a cultural change and a workflow change, which means nothing we do in R&D, we can just hand over. We've got to change not only the technology, but the way people use it, the way the workflows work, the way the consumers use it. So there's a whole play on partnerships, there's a whole play on government funding, there's a whole way on consortiums that I think need to come to the forefront in order to make this thing happen. The other tricky thing about this is that energy is also a security issue, right? So you are not gonna make, um, you can't make just, you know, unilateral decisions on technology here and how it's deployed, right? The, not only the governments get involved from a regulatory perspective, but from a security perspective, they get involved too. So there is a number of other things that have to happen. So that's why the innovation techniques themselves need to change and be innovative. You know, the, we need to innovate on the innovation techniques itself to get this happen. So it's both capacity and the innovation techniques. One other area to, to mention mm -hmm. is the role that automation can play, right? So within the, the, our customers themselves, digital tools can help with automation. Now, automation sometimes gets equated with job loss, but really automation can free up some of that talent that Colin's been talking about to go and work on those challenges where we need human talent, where we need to mm -hmm. focus that human effort and let digital tools do the things that digital tools do well, which is automation, which is standard work that can be done, which is pulling together data, doing that data analysis. So utilizing digital tools by themselves to increase levels of automation where it makes sense is another way of freeing up some of that talent, redeploying it into those innovation areas where we really need that human effort. You know, that's a great point by Linda, because the other thing I'll add to that is that we're not just talking about generation or transmission distribution. Think about factories. Factories have to remove carbon. So if you want to apply automation to take away jobs that are dull, dirty, dangerous, in those environments to free up the talent, you've got to do it in the factories. You've also got to do it in the refineries. You've got to do it in the building maintenance. You've got to do it in construction, because all of those things add carbon to the air. So this notion of automation and technologies will apply to all of the other industries that rely on energy itself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, then that plays to this broadening energy transition, which increasingly is seeing involvement from industrial sectors, manufacturing, um, heavy industries, et cetera. So um, absolutely. I, I guess the flip side of this coin, um, we often talk about uh, how to drive further R&D and you know, what R&D or what innovations we're seeing as kind of holding potential. But on, on the other side, I'm keen to understand if you think there's any kind of quote unquote white space in this, in this R&D area at the moment, you know, where do we need to see greater levels of investment, greater levels of research or greater levels of development? Colin, perhaps we'll just come back to you first on that one. 
Sure. Um, it, it, we talked about the physical side. There's a lot of stuff on the mm -hmm. physical side we need to do, but in terms of the digital side, when I think about technology, um, the things that will help us, you know, as Linda talked about the dynamics here, you're going to be doing a lot more forecasting. You need to forecast the weather. If you're going to have a lot of things that depend upon, you know, the weather, right, sun, wind, then you need to forecast that better. But more than that, you need to forecast the effects of that weather on the assets we have. You just look at last year's summer. To our surprise, we normally expect a week or two where the wind doesn't blow in Europe. Mm. It was so for close to a month. Right. Uh, why? Uh, I mean, we don't know. OK, did you have a backup plan? Did you have scenarios in which we could have anticipated that or oh, just reacted to it? Well, no, we didn't have that. So you saw the prices rise of gas. You, so you have to understand getting forecasting right, getting optimization right, getting analytics right on the assets we currently have. Some of the assets are much older. Right. In many cases, they're going towards obsolescence. Can you really understand how much more they can take? And when do you maintain them in a way that you could still reduce costs? So I think there's a technology around all about forecasting, optimizing. There's a workflow technology. Linda talked about the fact that AI and machine learning need to be involved, but they need to be involved in, with humans. What AI is good at is when I have a lot of patterns and I use those patterns to train a model. What a human is good at looking at is when one or two instances occur, not a lot, and they could quickly recognize a pattern. That's why kids don't need a lot of examples to learn something. We have that in humans. So now it's the AI and the humans working together. The AI seeing larger patterns from, from watching a lot of data and the humans being able to pick up new patterns really quickly and that combination coming together. Even when inspectors, we have AI inspecting turbines. Well, some new failures they can't detect where the human could say, I, I understand that because we know the fundamentals by which we use the materials and design the equipment and manufacture the equipment. That human plus AI workflow is gonna be very important. And I think the last one, Linda hit beautifully, automation. We, we can't have humans do every single thing. We learned in COVID, automation does indeed work. We have great examples. Free up those humans to work with the AI to think of creative things that change the world. So I'll stop there, but I think there's a lot of work to do and a lot of work to that we can help do in GE. Just to uh, just to add on to the that workflow concept that, that Colin articulated well, there's an element I and mean, there's a white space element around how we accelerate change and how we help our customers go through the workflow transformation that they have to go through in order to maximize the impact they're going to get from all these tools. Um, I, I think that's that's an aspect that is just as important from a technology and from a, an innovation standpoint as lots of code and lots of new hardware. If we don't also address the fundamental changes that work, workers and customers are gonna be going through in their workflows themselves, we're not gonna be as successful as we need to be. Another point just to, re, just to uh, add on, when we talked about what can humans, Quick, quick recognition of changes in, in patterns and, and what humans can do. One of the great examples of that that we're going to see more and more is the change in utilization, for example, of a gas plant. A gas plant that is traditionally was traditionally built and for the last 20, 30 years has been running at a base level, a very steady state, always producing energy, pretty much well matched with demand. Well, as renewables become more and more of the fuel of choice, many of those base, run, base load gas plants are gonna start running in what we call peak load. They're going to run much more intermittently. Those are patterns that that plant hasn't seen before, that that equipment hasn't seen before. And some of the early learnings of what happens when we change the operation fingerprint, if you will, for that type of plant, are going to be detected by humans. We add that learning and we and we add that to the, the artificial intelligence and machine learning, you get all three of those together. That's really where you optimize the knowledge that comes from those changes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, you actually picked up on something there, um, Linda, that I wanted to come to next, really. And, and one of the big things that, that we hear a lot at the moment is, is people really wanting to have a, a clear understanding of how um, 
how this is impacting on customers and how companies are assisting and enabling uh, customers uh, to kind of drive forward this transition. So um, if we zero in now and focus in on, on, I guess, some more of the technology and some more of the software uh, topics that we've been discussing, but, but look really at what GE Digital is doing in this space, um, I'd be keen to understand, firstly, if you can talk to us more about the work you're doing uh, and, and how you're solving some of the challenges that companies are facing through the energy transition. Sure, sure. No, I'd be happy to. So one example that comes to mind is some of the work that we've done with a customer in Algeria. And this ties to what we started talking about at the beginning of this webinar, which is not just the energy transition driving a need for digitization, but also COVID and the shift in the way in which we're working, the need for and the desire for workers to work remotely. Our customer in Algeria has been able to utilize the digital monitoring tools that they had in their monitoring and diagnostic center and provide remote access to those tools to their workers so that all the way through the pandemic, their workers were able to continually monitor the health of their assets, take actions and, and implement strategies to maximize the health of those assets using the remote tools in their M&D center, as well as remote tools to actually operate the plant. So we've provided new capabilities that were needed during COVID when workers needed to be remote, but going forward, we'll provide additional flexibility to our customers to, to be able to work remotely whether that's because of mm. ongoing COVID, vari COVID variations or whether that's just the change in desired work patterns of workers, whether that's fueled by the great resignation, those are all aspects that we've been working on with our digital worker capabilities, our remote operations capabilities and the capabilities within our asset performance management suite itself. One good example. Yeah. I'll add to that. If I look at G-Digital, Linda talked about the power we have in, you know, one of our businesses, you know, which is which is around all asset management, you know, both for the generators, yeah. the generation of electricity, but also for the downstream, for the actual oil and gas companies that that take, you know, the fuel out of the ground. That's one part of what we do in G-Digital. The other part is we have software that actually deals with the grid itself in which we are optimizing the flow of electrons, you know, across transmission and distribution, you know, roughly two to 40% of the electrons that run in the world, you know, across the transmission lines are driven by GE software. Then we also have software that's looking at the manufacturing sector. We talked about the fact that if you want to decarbonize, you've got to make the, the manufacturing sector more efficient. So we have software that actually begins to help optimize that sector, visualize it first with historians and MESs, but then optimize it with some of the other capabilities. And then we also do transportation as well in aviation. We have software there that can help the pilots optimize fuel, you know, as well. So there's a suite of things that we can provide that give you that capability across the full system-wide end-to-end wing. And Linda gives some great examples of actually going down to see what, you know, in one of those that you literally do with customers. But that's what we're trying to do as GE attempts to, de to add to this decarbonizing of the world, but more importantly, getting us a new source of green energy that, you know, we can all, you know, put to use. It's the basis of the, the rest of our civilization. If you don't get the energy right, very few things work. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, Linda, is there anything you wanted to pick up on, on, on there in terms of the importance of software in, in delivering decarbonization? Sure, yeah. No, I, I think Colin said it well. And of course, the entire GE Digital suite of products has a tie back to accelerating sustainability, accelerating circularity, and accelerating decarbonization. Um, I mean, one other specific example that I could give is a new application that we just released that literally works in the control system of an aeroderivative turbine. An aeroderivative turbine is sort of by design uh, a faster, it, it starts faster, it stops faster. So it's the perfect type of turbine for that more intermittent type of use case that I talked about. And we just released some, a new application called autonomous tuning, which takes into account the 
adjustments in the air, the, the adjustments to the controls that are required based on ambient temperature, fuel sources, the health of the asset itself to optimize the operation of that asset in order to reduce emissions. So again, a more specific example, but a, a good example of how a digital tool can make a, a material impact in driving emissions down for a particular piece of equipment that's an important part of the broader equation in allowing us to become more reliant on renewable fuel sources. Let me pick up on a point Linda made before that I think now um, that, that, that I'd like to push on. You know, we've built all, we have these capabilities, but Linda said before that unless you can enable the customers to use it, nothing happens, right? Because that's how this is. We give you a great technology, you can't put it in your workflow. And so I know that she and the team have spent time figuring out how do you actually get the customer's workflow to change? And you've got to do that by looking at every persona. You've got to do that by looking at the person using it. They, they have a certain value prop they want, how easy it is to use. But also, you know, people at different levels, some have value prop that say, what's the financial value? Others, what's the operational value? So that piece of work, I think, is seminal as well, because, you know, humans have to engage because we mentioned the fact that it's humans working with software and AI. And if you don't find ways to make them engage easily, none of this great technology gets put into their hands or, or maybe it does and it doesn't get utilized properly. So it takes longer in this transition or it doesn't scale as well. So I think that's the other thing that, you know, we spend time on. And some of the examples she mentioned all have that workflow element where we're going in and making sure the customers understand how to use these capabilities or else it never translates into overall value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a, a couple uh, of, of minutes left. So I think a, a nice way to, to finish really would be to, to look at crystally, crystallizing down uh, everything we've spoken about for the last kind of 40, 45 minutes. And, um, you know, if I asked, or, or if someone came to you and asked really to, to summarize and um, and to boil down why, just why digital and why software is so important to the realization of, of the energy transition. Um, perhaps we could use that um, as, a, as a question for some, some closing remarks. Um, Linda, should we come to you, you first there? Sure, sure. Well, uh, I'll try to not repeat everything I said, mm -hmm. but you know, I think if I take a step back, this is, as I've said to, to our team many times, this is sort of a once in a lifetime existential crisis, right? This is, this is saving the planet for generations to come. And every, this is the ultimate team challenge. And by team, I'm talking about the entire world. It's not just digital, it's not just hardware, it's not just the, the changes in use cases, it's not just switching to electric vehicles, it's not just adding a few more wind turbines all of those things are going to play a role. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you think about trying to tackle this global crisis without utilizing what we all know are the most important tools for accelerating progress, which are digital tools, which are pulling disparate sources of data together and gleaning insight and information and intelligence from that data in a, in a, speed with a speed that humans couldn't necessarily do on their own and with foresight that humans couldn't necessarily do on their own there's no possible way we're going to solve this global challenge without heavy utilization of digital tools as an important part of the process and accelerator to the process so colin mm -hmm. uh, um i think you said all of it uh, i'll add one thing to to, to just frame it at a certain level. You know, we talk at length for the last 45 minutes about how dynamic the environment is. Everything is changing, right? We also talked about how complex it is. There's not another, you know, industry like this. I can't afford, while I'm changing it, the electricity has to be stable, affordable, and resilient, right? You know, again, I don't go, and when I turn my lights on, I don't clap, right? I expect it to be there. When it's not there, my life changes dramatically. So in this very dynamic transformation, everything else must be stable, affordable, resilient. And I don't have a lot of information. 
How do I do that? It's across a wide scope of things, not just generation, but all the other industries. The only way I think you do that is by having these software capabilities to actually help you understand the problem, predict things, orchestrate things, and then optimize things. You know, I don't see that there's another way we can do it. Mm. You know, and everything we talked about were elements of that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And given the complexity and, and a huge amount more that I'm sure we could have covered today, perhaps, perhaps we should all start clapping when we turn the lights on. Uh, given given everything that goes into that process, so. yes. I know. Um, as for today, I, I think that is about all we we do have time for. A, a quick reminder that we'll be continuing to hear from GE and GE Digital throughout the year on our flagship uh, energy transition program at Reuters. Uh, there'll be a utility transition in a few weeks' time, industry transition later in the year, and we're also working on some white papers with them at the moment, which I'm hugely excited to share with you later in the year. But as for today and, and as for this session, um, I just want to say again, a massive thank you to, to Linda and to Colin uh, for joining us. Thank you both for joining us. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And, and thanks as well to everyone tuning in. And um, we hope you can join us again soon. And as I say, do watch out for the host more uh, content we have with GED throughout the year. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks.